Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle. This is the Vertigree Table, where I have made an adventure for you. And it feels like a really good one. I am very excited to share it with you. The Eyeless in the Dark is optimized for level 1 Dungeons & Dragons characters, but it is easily adapted for second level characters and above. Send your players deeper and deeper into the darkness below, traveling further and further from the light of the surface until they come across terrifying monstrosities from the world of the Underdark. Monsters that will eat their gear, monsters that might turn them into stone, and a tribe of twisted humanoids transformed by their time in the hostile environments deep below the ground to become the Eyeless cannibalistic brutes that will make our hero's first adventure a memorable and potentially horrifying one. The dwarves of the Groover Iron Mine in the nearby hill country have delved too greedily and dug too deep, a tale as old as time, right? And they hit a cavity into the Underdark. This caused a cave in the mineshaft collapse, which is bad, but something that the dwarves could have handled themselves. They're dwarves, after all. What they could not handle alone, what they are looking to hire are adventurers to help them deal with is the pack of Grimlocks that came pouring out of that dark hole with a baby basilisk catchling whose gaze turned unsuspecting miners into stone. Some first level adventures out there feel pretty low stakes. Go fight these rats and centipedes in the basement, you fantasy exterminators. But this will be some people's first taste of Dungeons and & Dragons, and I wanted to craft an experience that really makes an impact, that feels like it has consequences. I also set out to elevate a monster, one that experienced players may have come across, though a lot less frequently than, say, goblins or kobolds, and one that will make a big impression on new players, I hope. I took the Grimlock, which is easily dismissed, right? A lowly CR, one quarter, unsophisticated brute, the first time you see it in the monster manual, right? But a, a second look reveals that these things have pretty incredible potential to bring the monstrosity. The Eyeless in the Dark is up on the DMs Guild with the entire work available for you to see for free in the preview. If you like it, making a purchase helps me to make more of these adventures for you and is deeply appreciated by me. Ratings and reviews also help other people to find this, and I do love to hear any stories you may have on running this adventure. If you are watching this on YouTube, the description has the link down below. If you are not on YouTube, you should consider hopping over to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss the next big thing. Now on top of the adventure itself, which has a unique magic item and a unique monster in there, I've included notes to the DM throughout it to give newer dungeon masters an extra helping hand, and experienced dungeon masters may still find some real nuggets of good inspiration in there as well. In this video, I'm actually going to take things one step further. I'm going to go over the entire adventure to help you prepare to run it, to help you give your players an excellent game night, and it's also going to serve as a nice like walkthrough if you're considering picking this up. All right, so after the cover, which I'm really proud of, by the way, I'm not a graphic designer by any stretch, but I think I hit that like old school horror movie poster retro vibe at least a little bit. <laughs> okay, sorry. After the cover, on page one, we get a little bit of the setup work, right? This is optimized for four first level characters who should hit level two upon completion. This will take about three to four hours, though people play at different speeds, and it could be faster and it could be slower depending on your style your table, and then we take a look at where this all goes down. I was careful to make this easy enough to drag and drop just about anywhere in your campaign world, but if you're doing this in Forgotten Realms, then Phandalin or maybe Seacomer are suggested starting towns with hills nearby to place the mine. Then we're going to get a note here on how this could be combined with my hill country encounters and or other locations like that to make a more open world sandbox feel or to flesh this out into a full campaign. This can definitely be run as its own standalone one shot, but I've also left plenty of room here to connect it into a larger story as well. Up next, we get a little like, hey, this is what read aloud text blocks look like. And then this is the format for Dungeon Master design notes. And then we get into it. I gave you the background, and now here's a taste of what's going on with the Grimlocks. This section of the Underdark that the dwarves breached was actually like a finger of the Grimlock territory that the Caven has now sealed off. 
isolating about a dozen or so members from the rest of their tribe. Gurm, who is the strongest of them, has naturally taken over, and this was also the tunnel leading to like a grotto where they were keeping a baby basilisk hatchling. Turns out having no eyes does have some benefits. To wrap up this introduction, I've got a passage here on controlling tone and, you know, controlling uh, creative control. This adventure could very easily be run in a very creepy, suspenseful way. We could have the players on the edge of their seats waiting for the next thing to emerge from the darkness, absolutely. But in actual play, Dungeons & Dragons can go very Monty Python as easily as it can go grim, dark horror. And I don't get to tell you how you, the Dungeon Master, run your game. And the players at that table are also going to have a say here as well. But I do recommend to not let the occasional humor, don't let jokes make you feel like you're losing the, the, the motif, the feel, the atmosphere that you're trying to create because humor and fear can actually be a great combination. I also really stress player choice here in this section. I'm going to make a whole video on this or a whole series of videos on this eventually, but it is important for new dungeon masters to know and veteran dungeon masters to remember that there are other people at the the table here and they are contributing to this story which means there are multiple ways for players to engage with any given encounter i find a lot of adventures kind of just assume the players will act very specifically one particular way but i have done my best here to help the dm expect and embrace the unexpected all right let's get into it we start in a tavern as is tradition a, uh, a dwarf walks into a bar a dwarf limps up to our adventurers on crutches oh there's already some sort of story here right now do with dormir bronze flask as you will make him your own i encourage you but in in my mind he's a, a tough but kind you know true blue collar union card carrying foreman of this mine he's got a little appalachian coal miner vibe for me but if you want to make him that like vanilla scottish dwarf that's actually that's not too far off from appalachian they're related but whatever if you want to rather make him some favorite anime character or like an old-timey catskill comedians by all means go for it make him your own have fun with it dormir tells us the story of what happened in the mine and offers a reward for going down there and clearing it out he also offers an additional reward for finding and returning his magical pickaxe and introduces a little like mystery element as well in the possibly thieving Jasper Feldspar. He suspects old Jasper there was stealing hematite. Hematite, which is a like a crystalline iron compound that's worth 10 gold apiece according to the Dungeon Master's Guide. And Dormir also tells us that Jasper Feldspar turned to stone before for his very eyes and toppled over and shattered. That's actually how Dormir got his injury. A piece of poor old thieving Jasper took out a chunk of Dormir's legs. So in a pretty tight little package, we've got all sorts of appeals here to get our players invested in this quest. There's the gold, of course, money, and magic items, and a couple intriguing mysteries. We get the old call to adventure as well, and just, you know, the fact that level one heroes are going to have to do something to gain experience and reputation if they don't want to be rat catchers their whole careers, right? We can add an extra little incentive here as well if the party decides they want to do a little gearing up before they leave town, which is usually a good idea. As they are out shopping, they can see the impact the mine being shut down has had on the local economy. A lot of the things that adventurers like to buy are made out of iron, right, or steel. And with the mine shut down, that stuff is going to be harder to get. It's going to be more expensive or just plain unavailable and this adds a nice dose of like interconnectedness realism for me that's the good stuff what the heroes do is going to make an impact that benefits them and the other people in this town it's also like a cool gamification thing of like unlocking item upgrades 
I've got a Dungeon Master note here on how you can just provide a synopsis of all of this and like start your players right at the entrance of the mine with reasons you might want to do that and why you might prefer not to do that. But this is a good option if you are pressed for time. You want to make sure you complete a single one shot in a single session, especially if you're running new players. Things are naturally going to move slower as you like go over the rules and review mechanics. But I still make the argument for giving them the full D&D experience. Experience and starting in the tavern. And if you did want to like stretch things out, go the other way, uh, if this is going to be a larger, you know, it's a piece of a larger campaign, you can add in overland travel and random encounters like the ones from the integrated tables. On the next page, we get to the mine. The miners threw a barrier up before they left, presenting us with a chance to make some athletics checks and maybe some acrobatics checks to get through, even some dexterity saving throws if you're feeling spicy. And I like doing something like this first thing, especially Especially with new players as we get to go over like the dice mechanics and the character sheets before the life and death pressure of combat is starting to set in. Even if everybody fails every check here we are still getting inside of this mine because we don't want to lock it up. We don't want to lock the adventure here and you can have a lot of fun describing their failures as well as their successes. Make them feel heroic. I would also really lean into the descriptions of the dark mine here. I'm giving you boxed text of descriptions, but I encourage you to adapt to that, embellish it, because this is where you're really going to set the tone and build tension. We are slowly submerging the players deeper and deeper into this fantasy world, moving away from the light of the everyday surface world and traveling down into the darkness where here there be monsters. There's a little optional encounter here where the player characters might come across a helpful NPC to cast aid on them or maybe pass out some healing potions or something. The world is a dangerous place and notoriously unkind to level one adventurers, and that's a feature, not a bug. But if you do want to give them a little hit point cushion without just starting out at level two, this is a very good way to do it. This is also a chance for a little more like roleplay potentially, and you might be glad that you introduced somebody capable of casting greater restoration later on. Stay tuned. There's a Coatl, polymorphed, masquerading as a blind priest in the hill encounters that I wrote, and he's a great fit for this. He can do a lot of things for your campaign, actually. I love that guy. My players don't trust him. They know something's up there, but that's that's all the story for a different video. The first thing we come across is a busted cart where the miners are storing slash just like dumping their gear. It is conveniently located at the exact point where we have to go over the rules for dark vision. I am going to do a dark vision video eventually too, I think, because there's definitely, this is something I see people get wrong a lot. But I have a little breakdown with page references so you can fully understand the mechanic. You decide, you know, you want to rule it another way, no problem. It's just good to know what the official mechanics are, even if you're going to change them. Now there's actually a whole collection of stuff here in this ore cart with various levels of utility. The mirrors, which the miners use to like reflect more light to get more light out of their lanterns, are actually maybe the most useful, valuable thing here as they can really help us in the final fight. Now the players might not realize this, but because they are kind of the most unusual thing here and get a little bit of extra description and come at the end of that first list of like more mundane things, someone might pick up that there's something to notice here. If not, no big deal. There's another more conspicuous mirror coming up down the line, and they could totally complete this adventure without a mirror anyway. Don't fret. Uh, this mine cart also forces the party to go into a single file formation to pass it. The corridor is 10 feet wide. Most of them are here. So before and after this little bottleneck, they can travel to abreast. And I like giving you the chance to get this marching order established both ways right up front in the adventure. If you ask later on who's in front when it's actually going to matter, you might get a different, you know, metagamey answer based on some context clues. On the next page, we get the maps. We are getting into it now. I've made a side view of the entire mine, which shows all of the key locations and their like relative depths. And I've also made this top-down view of the natural cavern, which is our next stop with number three and number four. We also get like a little zoom in on the final room, but last things last. So we transition, we cross a boundary from this like cloying, maybe claustrophobic space of the mine shaft into this large open 
cavern. Now we're in a space that wasn't made orderly and controlled by people, but shaped by nature. The dwarves came through and like smoothed out the floor here, but the walls are all rough stone and most of them are so far away that they're actually lost in the darkness, dark vision or no, creating the sense that anything could be out there waiting in the unknown. Bats have moved in since the mine went quiet and hang upside down between the stalactites on the ceiling. And we might spot them with a perception check or we might identify them from the guano on the floor. As the dungeon master, you can always call for whatever kind of check you think is appropriate, but I wrote nature, which seems obvious, and arcana here because fun fact, bat guano is an explosive material and it's a component in that beloved spell Fireball. If the players are quiet and don't shine a bright light up there, the bats might leave them alone. But odds are we're going to have a combat here. And there are three swarms, which technically pushes us out of easy territory for four level one characters, sure. But I would have them all flying, you know, all over the place erratically like bats do. And this is going to provide a teaching moment about opportunity attacks, right, and reactions, as well as the other combat mechanics, while serving to make this fight easier. I also have a note here describing how I might also have these bats dash away if they take enough damage, maybe when they fall below half health or a quarter health, or maybe when there's only one left, because I like showing new players especially that not everything is going to want to fight to the death necessarily. Especially something like a beast is going to possess a survival instinct, which can give the players more ways to approach combat encounters. Now, if you want to be a little bit nasty, or well, maybe a lot nasty, you know, maybe you've got some experienced strategic players at your table, sneaking under these bats might actually just postpone their attack until things get a little noisy in the next encounter on the far side of this space, which then they can join into. Now, some people might be surprised to find a rust monster in a level one adventure, and those people are going to be really surprised when they see it's not a rust monster, but two rust monsters here on the far side of this space, eagerly gobbling up all the mining equipment over there. I love remembering that player characters can get hurt without losing any hit points, and especially at low levels, showing players that there are real stakes and consequences in D&D. They might be riding really high, right, after easily smashing up a ton of bats, and now some real monsters come along. Though these things don't want to hurt you necessarily, they just want your precious weapons and armor. If you hurt them, only then will they start to try to bite back, but, you know, when you hurt them, your sword corrodes, so maybe there's another way here. We did give them a pile of metal stuff when they walked into this mine, and there's definitely some expendable gear on their character sheets from their starting gear, right? I'm sure, though it's going to be a couple difficult choices to make, but maybe we can fill these things up so that they leave us alone. I might even allow an animal handling check, though technically these are not beasts if I was feeling particularly magnanimous. Plus, don't worry, I have sprinkled some weapons around so nobody resourceful is going to be rolling unarmed attacks for the rest of this adventure. Do not be afraid to melt all of their stuff. Worst case scenario, we gotta head back to town to pick up some armor. And that's no big deal, just the cost of doing business, right? Nothing needs to be different when we get back here yet. And additionally, it's another chance to have the, the blacksmith say something like, this is the last set of armor for sale until that mine situation gets resolved. If things go real sideways here, you know, beyond pacifying and killing these rust monsters outright, the party might also be able to drive them off. Again, why would they fight to the death? They might scurry back down deeper, but there's no more iron down there, right? They already ate it all, and the Grimlocks don't have any. They don't work with it, which is why the rust monsters don't really bother them. So maybe these guys would escape out the entrance to terrorize the surface world, and that way they could even cross paths with our players again down the road at later levels. So for treasure, most everything metal has been transformed to piles of rust dust here, but there are a couple wood toys 
torches and clay pots of lantern oil, lamp oil, and another mirror, this one made of copper, so it survived the rust monsters and maybe calls a little more attention to itself. There is also one conspicuous gleaming pickaxe that is remarkably untouched, and it turns out that's because it's magical. We have found Dormer's Lucky Pickaxe. Now, I'm not going to break your game at level one. This is basically just a, it's a simple D6 weapon that's also a flashlight. It casts light on itself. What I think is particularly cool about it is that you can do slashing or piercing damage, depending on which side you hit the target with. Plus, you know, it is magic, so it will still hit things things that are resistant or even immune to mundane weapons. I really wanted to make something just cool enough to create a sort of moral quandary to, to tempt the players to keep it for themselves and not turn it back over to Dormir. Two paths diverged in the natural cavern. Entry five here is the old mine shaft on the left. The doors dug out all the iron, the seams played out, and they moved on and started digging the shaft on the right at six. Now five is fairly flat, while six really goes down, which is a little clue to like, hey, maybe check out this side first. All the waste rock and like scrap wood in here is another little signal to the players that, hey, this one is out of use now. And it's also a chance to hand out some non-metal weapons to characters whose steel turns to dust in their hands. The party might just pass this left-hand passage by, and that's no problem, but it would be a shame because this is where Jasper was hiding his ill-gotten loot before he lost a staring contest with our baby basilisk. It is nice to insert these like little mysteries and treasure drops to reward players for paying attention and exploring their environment. This also provides a nice little upbeat, a nice victory after we've melted their stuff and right before we delve deeper into to the darkness and find the real horror show stuff. So entering at six, we resume our descent and come upon our first confrontation with these Grimlocks. The first time we see them, they are actually feasting on the dead. And these dwarves have been down here decomposing for a little while by now. And it also turns out that these Grimlocks are also eating their own fallen while they're at it. Season to taste, but this can be a very gruesome scene with grisly sounds and horrendous smells to go along with it. I am particularly fond of that beat, that moment when these monsters look up from their disgusting feasts and reveal the smooth skin, the patches where their eyes would be. <laughs> uh, the, these, these things have no eyes? Nope, these things have no eyes. Roll for initiative. Now this four versus four is actually a pretty tough fight, but we've set things up so that the players get the drop on these guys and a surprise round could really shift the odds of a battle. It's also another potential teaching moment and a way to throw a lot at the party without worrying too much about a TPK. Again, with like experienced players, you might not want to pull punches as much, but even so, the players are going to have several encounters with the same monster type. So it's good to have ways to, to make each encounter feel distinct. And I think this is a good one. All right, next page. I really like this picture of the Grimlock. The one in the monster manual is fine, a little less scary, and you definitely get less of that like eyeless weirdness. Uh, but feel free to show the players both, right, at different moments. Some Grimlocks might look like the uh, frumpier Monster Manual one, and some, like Grum, are going to be more swole and scary like this fellow. So at the end of this mineshaft, we reach the point where the dwarves breached the Underdark and the cave-in happened. And here, three Grimlocks are clearing the way back home now, and are therefore harder to surprise than their, their friends up at the dinner party. They do only speak under common as written, but we might end up having a conversation with this group. And it would be nice to make explicit to the players, hey, here's your ticking clock. There's more Grimlocks and who knows what else on the other side of that debris, and it might be bad if a portal to the Underdark gets opened here. We are also, you know, opening the door for negotiations. If we're more interested in diplomacy than simply hacking and slashing our way to the conclusion, nothing wrong with that. And these are pretty savage 
cannibals who used to serve the Mind Flayers, so maybe they're not the most, you know, trustworthy negotiators. But we are uh, giving the players options. We're also giving the players another round of clues in the aftermath at this point. Here is a piece of statue that's actually poor old Jasper's face, or what's left of it. And, you know, if that doesn't do it, here's a stone canary in a coal mine in an iron mine. <laughs> and if no one gets it, it's not your fault. We've done our due diligence, and you can turn people into stone with a clear conscience later on. Through the breach, and now we've reached the Underdark. And you have poetic license to get as descriptive as you want here. Get gonzo, get weird with it. You want crazy geological formations lit by bioluminescent fungi. Go for it. Sights, sounds, smells, vibes. Go to town. In contrast to the orderly dwarven-shaped passages up above, this is chaotic. This is difficult terrain. And I've made a conscious choice not to include, like, deep detailed maps for these 10 foot wide by super, super long spaces, because honestly, I don't think you need them. Two lines on a grid will do it, be they straight for the mine shafts and like curvy for uh, this portion and the underdark. And while that might sound boring, I think you're actually going to find fighting in these like tight quarters might actually create some interesting strategic choices for the players. Plus, it's going to make the battles that happen in the more open spaces feel different in contrast. Because here we've got two Grimlocks approaching and two more hanging back, using that special ability to blend into the rocky terrain and hopefully, for their sakes, ambush the party. Now, in a battle, one of these Grimlocks from either pair might also decide to run and tell Gurm that intruders are coming, making that final combat that much harder and showing that these are intelligent enemies that have some capability of reacting to the player's actions and strategizing. And this is coming at a point where we are likely looking at a short or even a long rest being in the cards. If the players retreat back to the natural cavern, or better yet, set up shop in that played out mine shaft at five, they're likely to get a rest uninterrupted. But if they kill a bunch of Grimlocks and then take a nap beside the breach to the Underdarker within it, yeah, maybe something's gonna find them. It is a good idea to go into the final fight at full strength, though, and if you've got brand new players, don't be afraid to do a little bit of coaching and walk through the rest mechanics with them. Now, aid only lasts eight hours, so if you made use of that option, then technically a long rest will wipe out those temporary hit points. You do have my permission to ignore that, though. Maybe when a flying celestial snake creature in disguise casts it, it's a longer duration. You might not need it or want it, though, because a final battle should feel climactic, right? So we head down these steps, and the final room opens up to an irregular 30 foot by 40 foot roughly cave, the grotto, where the back third or so is a little bit higher than the rest to maybe tee up a little interest and drama in this fight. This rise also acts like a stage, and it's where we're going to find Gurm the biggest and baddest of these Grimlocks, and the real star of the show beside him, our Basilisk Hatchling. Now, there is a chance that Gurm has been alerted, and there's also a chance that we've marched down here with other Grimlocks to negotiate. Maybe we've convinced them to take me to your leader, right? But odds are we're going to walk in and find Gurm just hanging out up there, beside a napping baby basilisk. And I might do that regardless of where Gurm is, because it sets up that like echoing beat, that same dramatic kind of moment, the, the big reveal, probably in the first round of combat where the noise, or maybe like a nudge of Gurm's nasty foot, awakens our little basilisk catchling, our monster baby, and it opens its glowing eyes. Now, avoiding the petrifying gaze is as simple as looking away, but now you're fighting blind. Disadvantage on your attack rolls, plus attacks against you have advantage now. Gurm and the Grimlocks have blind sight, but our heroes do not. And DC 11 is about as low as it goes, but first level characters can definitely fail this save, especially if the spellcaster dumped constitution. We might be looking at a runaway, runaway type of situation here. And again, don't be afraid to coach brand new players a little bit if needed. If they run, I'd give them an hour or so before Gurm and his pet come looking for them so that they can roll some hit dice. If they want to take a long rest, you know, just outside Gurm's grotto, kindly remind the players that D&D is not a video game and the baddies aren't just likely to sit around waiting for the heroes to come kill them. 
you know, maybe he won't find them over in five, and he almost definitely won't follow them up to the surface. Let the players talk and take inventory there, you know, before they go in or after they run away and are thinking about going back in. Um, you know, let them talk for as long as they need to, because it, it can be tempting to keep the pressure on, but debating how to tackle a difficult challenge is definitely still playing D&D. So honestly, to me, using the mirror to, to see without like suffering blindness and uh, without getting petrified by meeting this thing's gaze, it seems as intuitive, if not more intuitive, than showing the basilisk its own reflection, which, okay, has mythological foundations. So personally, I would let both of those things work. And if the players come up with anything else remotely feasible, right? They go full apocalypse now, and they're mixing the bad guano with the lamp oil to make fantasy napalm and burn them out, whatever. Let it happen. Try to reward creativity. If and when they clear this room tucked away in the back, they're going to find a basilisk egg. How much is it worth? Who would be willing to buy it? Is it a ticking time bomb? These are questions that I leave up to you, the dungeon master, to provide answers for. But if, if, if you want to say it's worth 100 gold pieces and just hand wave the rest of the questions, you know, just let them write down 100 gold pieces, that's definitely an option. But I think there's a real opportunity to drive further adventure by finding a buyer, right? Maybe a wizard or a warlock or a druid or some black market smuggler with connections to the criminal underworld, to the thieves guild. You know, start a conversation with an NPC like that and who knows what quest hooks are are going to come from it. Also, who knows when adding in a full-grown basilisk to a encounter to a boss fight can make the players, you know, sessions away from now groan for not considering the consequences of their action when they pawned that basilisk egg. And yes, you want to give your players a pet basilisk, go for it. And also you can say that they don't know what's required for hatching it if you don't want them to have one, that's okay. Or maybe it's not automatically friendly. They expect it to like imprint when it first emerges from its shell, but it turns out, nope, it's just hungry. If this is a one shot, leaving an open-ended question like this for the players, you know, might keep their imaginations working in the background for days and get them eager to play this game again. I have got on this page what is by far the longest DM note, and it talks about how to proceed if the player characters wipe or if some of them die. Now, I won't rehash it. I'll let you read it. I'm going to simply add, especially if this is a one-shot or maybe part of like an open table, maybe West Marches style campaign, having only half the characters make it back alive, and some of them are dead and some of them are statues now, would definitely make for a memorable game night. Addressing loss, addressing failure like this is something I wish more adventures did, especially adventures built for new DMs. And on the next page, I've also got what might happen if the players fail and like walk away in the greater scheme of things, or if they never come down here in the first place. That's another thing I'd like to see more of. And Dungeon Masters should be doing it for themselves until adventure designers start doing it for us. It, it helps us to figure out what the stakes are, what the point is. Why are the characters' decisions and actions meaningful here. And this actually dovetails nicely with ways to increase the challenge of this adventure at higher levels on top of simply increasing the number of Grimlocks down here, and there's a good story reason for that. And I do mention upping their HP too as well at some point. Um, once they've got that cave-in cleared, all sorts of other things could come crawling and climbing out of the Underdark. The Dark Mantles, Ropers, the Drow, the Mind Flayers that these Grimlocks serve. Who knows? Go nuts. This is the kind of thinking that will help you build your campaign world and build a big open world sandbox game to give your players plenty of options without wasting prepared content. Now last but certainly not least, we get the conclusion if and when our heroes are victorious. We can just summarize this, especially if we're like out of time for game night, but it's going to be fun to go back to Dormir Bronze Flask and give the players a chance to recap the adventure to a wrapped audience. Let them give the highlight reel. We've also got some loose ends to tie up, right? There's the reward, of course, but there's the question, did they figure out the thief mystery and do they share with the class? And do they turn over this magic pickaxe. If this is the start of a campaign, Dormer could be important. He could also be planting seeds for the next quest. Maybe he's heard rumors about something, or he has a commendation for them to the mayor who has jobs for them, or maybe he's just dismayed to see this 
basilisk egg that they're carrying, and he sends them off to see the wizard. I think you and your players are going to have a blast with this. I can't wait for you to experience it, and I can't wait for you to come back and tell me about it. Get out there, have fun, be kind to yourself, be kind to each other. Hey, be kind, and thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye.